Hello to all of you. I'm so excited to be able to share space with all of you today in our session called More Windows and More Mirrors. And before I jump us into the content, I'll tell you a little bit about me. So I started out as a fourth and then fifth grade classroom teacher um, back in 2000, which is so, it's so for me, I'm like, even before I actually had my own classroom, I was getting my master's degree from Boston College in elementary teaching and um, was even working through graduate school by working at Boston College and paying for my degree that way. But I'm like, I don't feel like I want just the practicum. I really want to be immersed in a school. And so I actually left that job, continued in my program and worked um, full time as a as a teaching assistant um, for um, a fifth grade teacher. And so got to really start to do that work in around 1999. And so I, I never really imagined myself in this space. So you know how you go into um, professional development experiences and sometimes or when we used to go in person or even virtually, right? A lot of times they'll ask like, let's see a show of hands of people who've been teaching one to five years and five to 10 years. And I would always be in kind of in that first group or the first couple of groups. And now I'm like, whoa, I'm in the group where I'm just like 20 plus years, like I'd be able to, to say like I'm a veteran educator, but just really after being a classroom teacher, I became a literacy coach. And um, really, I mean, the, the teacher development bug hit me hard because what I really genuinely believe is that in order for us to create and sustain the types of classrooms that we all aspire toward, we can't do that without providing supports for the folks who are teaching students. And so I really, really enjoy, like loved being a literacy coach. I had the opportunity to be um, a full-time mentor to novice teachers in Boston um, for a while, had an opportunity to also be an elementary literacy director. And um, so now present I've been working for with Better Lesson for almost six years, started as an instructional coach and um, transitioned into a role as a diversity, equity and inclusion director. But literacy always has my heart. <laughs> so I'm really glad to be able to share space with all of you. Um, I was going to say this afternoon because it's afternoon for me. I am outside of Boston, but I should say this morning because you all are still in the morning. All right. So let's go ahead and jump into it. All right. So you should be seeing a slide that says windows and mirrors. Is that what you're seeing? Perfect. I always check because sometimes you get into a flow on Zoom and you think people are seeing something and they actually are not. So I always want to make sure that everything is all set. But really, I just want to start out by talking about the concept of windows and mirrors and my introduction to it has really been, um, you know, through the work of Rudine Sims Bishop, who was the orig originator of the concept, um, in, at least in, in, in discussing it in a way of making sure that when we think about creating our literacy experiences for students, that we want all students to be able to experience both windows and mirrors, right? And so when we think about windows for students, those are ways for students to be able to gaze beyond the ways that they may identify and the, the experiences that they've had like in their, themselves, in their families, in their communities, to be able to gaze through windows and to be able to discover and explore and learn more about the experiences and lives and histories of people who, who are different from them, right? And so that is um, a really great opportunity that we can provide for students to offer them windows. When we think about mirrors, all students also need the opportunity to be able to see themselves reflected in the curriculum. So when we're thinking about um, their racial background, their communities, their, you know, like all of the things that make us, our students who they are, they need to be able to see that represented in the um, in our content. And so one of the, one of the things that Rudine Simmons Bishop says is that when you look at sometimes when, when a mirror, when the sun hits the mirror just right, a, a window can become a mirror, right? And so we think about the how they're almost on two sides of the same coin as far as the experiences that we want to offer for students. What we face though, is that we, um, a lot of times when we're thinking about the literature, whether it be as part of a literacy curriculum or in picture books or in chapter books that the students are engaging with, we're looking at some, some of the things that I've been really mindful of is this infographic that I, I saw, the, the first infographic I saw was from 2012, where it shows that there was a vast overrepresentation of white children in children's books, where you look at children's books and 93% of them um, featured white children. 
And then when you look, I won't go into all of the different details, you can see the very small percentages that were across, um, across racial and ethnic difference. Very, very small. Like we see 3%, we see 1.5%, less than 1%, and 2% when we think about African-American and Black students, um, Latinx students, when we think about Native American or First Nations or Indigenous children, and then also Asian um, American and Pacific Islander children. And then um, too, that there was some representation of like animals and inanimate objects and things like that too. There was representation there, but we saw like this massive disparity in the representation in the literature in 2012. Then when we look at the same data from 2015, things seem to have gotten a bit better, right? So we look at the data and it shows that although the young white man we see all the way on the right, he has many mirrors all around him. You see the disco ball coming out of the ceiling. There's mirrors up there. There's mirrors in front of him and back of him all around him. He sees himself represented pretty widely, but we see that the percentage has gone down, right? It's gone, gone down to 73.3%. But then when we look across to the for students of color, it didn't really get much better across racial difference. We actually see where the increase took place largely was in the, the category of animals and trucks, right? And so that was in 2015. Then when we look at that data um, in 2018, then we start to see that when we look at the, um, the representation of white children, it has gone down again, right? We now see that it has shifted to, to 50%. So thinking about from 2012, going down from 93%, if you look at the data a certain way, that can look like great progress, right? But when we start to look at how the representation spread across is that we see that still there were only about 1% of, of books about um, Native American children, 5% for Latinx students, about 7% for Asian American Pacific Islander students, and about 10% for, for, um, for Black children. And, but we saw a massive boost for, for animals and trucks and things like that. And so what we actually saw was instead of it being like more sp spread across as far as racial and ethnic representation across all people groups, we actually saw the, saw the shift away from white students, but more toward um, animals and other and, and other characters instead of all different types of children. And so what I noticed just as I was looking at this, I, it seems to me that when we look at when we when we see that white students really don't have um, enough windows to looking into learning about other um, other folks. And then we see um, black and brown students not really being able to see themselves represented in literature, that that's, this is where we see um, a loss, right? We have see a loss in opportunity because we're not seeing that balance, right? That balance of both windows and mirrors for all students. And so I feel like when we don't get to see, when we don't get to see that students really can, so especially when we think about white students in particular, that we really don't get to have these meaningful conversations about the impact of racialization. We don't, we, and students can develop some harmful, uninformed mindsets about, um, about people who are different from them racially and ethnically. And then that can lead to like going from unconscious bias to microaggressions or micro inequities, um, where we hear um, students and, and adults too making comments like all lives matter. Doesn't mean that all lives doesn't matter. I think we all agree that they do, but it, 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 those like Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter don't have to be in opposition to one another. So there's some of the, some of the challenge there. We see um, folks who make comments like, when I look at you, I don't see color. Even though we understand that, I think the intent when making comments like that is to say like, I don't believe in being racist, which is a beautiful thing. But, but when we say we don't see color, it's, it's as if we are inferring that something is wrong with color or something is wrong with melanin. And that's not what we really believe or should believe. Um, I've heard this question in the past too. Why don't we have a white history month when we get around February? And I remember because I, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and then went to school in East Texas and had one of my white um, college mates ask me that. And it took me aback because I'm just like, what do you mean? <laughs> because I'm like, we have like, February is like the shortest month of the year. Like, <laughs> and then the rest of the year, we really, you know, we don't really get to engage in this learning very much, right? We sometimes have people have a misperception of things like affirmative action, thinking that that policy itself is racist when the reality is that the biggest, um, the people who benefit most from affirmative action are actually women um, and white women in particular. And then even having a misperception of things like um, kneeling during the national anthem, thinking that it's unpatriotic as opposed to what was meant to be like really to, to, to stand up against police violence. And so those are some of the misperceptions that can happen when we don't get to learn about one another across difference. 
And so I think that one of the things that I think happens in education spaces quite often is that we will espouse very beautiful things, right? Like I remember like thinking back into us to, you know, when differentiated education and dis differentiated instruction was, you know, something that we were really starting to lean into in even growth mindset. But a lot of times, even though we start to lean into those practices for students, we don't often benefit from that, that those perspectives for ourselves, right? So differentiation for ourselves as adult learners, or even thinking about growth mindset when it comes to ourselves, when it comes to like, to really thinking about the topics that we navigate in our literature with students. So I won't spend too much time here, but just basically too, we don't, we want to come away from having a fixed mindset about um, about difficult or challenging or critical topics to really having a growth mindset around it for ourselves so that we can have any hope of modeling that for our students. And so instead of being like frozen by feeling like we don't know what to say or be being concerned about cancel culture, which is a valid concern, right? Because I know that it can be really tricky, but just really being able to have resilience and to, and to persist through um, to making these shifts um, and or moving beyond feeling like we won't make a difference or that is something that we don't have time to do. We can have a more growth or open mindset to know that with effort, we can get better, just like we tell our students and that we really want um, to we'll, like read and listen and learn and know that we're going to make mistakes and that's okay because that's a part of the learning process and that we will make the time to, to, to engage in this work because it's essential work, right? And that we can make, we can be a part of making things better for students. And so I'm gonna take you through a journey here where we think about what it looks like when, first of all, we'll look at what it looks like when you have too many windows and not enough mirrors. And this is in particular for our students of color or students who are from marginalized um, identities. And I'm gonna do that through a gallery walk. And so before I show you these, um, these I, I pulled like pictures of different picture books and different pieces of literature. What I do wanna say right before we begin is that this, these um, recommendations are not in opposition to any literacy curriculum that anyone is implementing. It is actually just meant to have an opportunity to focus on what's possible and some ways that literacy curricula can be supplemented and enhanced by some of the other options that we have. If you notice in your literacy curriculum that um, um, ethnic and racial representation is not quite where you would like for it to be. And so let's just look at some of these beautiful picture books that we have that we have access to. So the first thing I want to talk about is at the elementary level, like thinking about positive identity development. So a lot of times I've seen this in my practice as well, that a lot of times when people are trying to diversify the content that they are engaging students with, we veer really toward the um, toward oppression, right? And so when we start looking at, like, say, black, I'll speak from, from the perspective of a black person in the United States whose ancestors um, were enslaved. So a lot of times when people are trying to be more inclusive, they'll be like, oh, we really need to teach about enslavement. Um, we need to teach about um, the civil rights movement. We need to really talk about like, you know, Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad and Martin Luther King Jr. and the, I, the, and the dream that he had and Rosa Parks and her resistance to being, you know, moved to, um, to the back of the bus. And I am not saying that those things are not important. I believe that they are essential, hard stop. And it's also really important to make sure that we are not myopic when we think about the representation that we want to include for students, we really want kids to really just see kids being kids, right? It doesn't have to be all about oppression or difficulty. It can be about just being a kid. So that's why I pulled like some of these images because these books are so, for me, feel so beautiful where it's like, you know, just thinking about like, you know, kids being babies or just thinking about what it feels like to appreciate your skin color or what is it like when you're like really trying to like when you when you have a goldfish and you're trying to figure things out having a, a goldfish as a pet and when you're thinking about um as a kid, like, you know, this one at the top left, especially Max and the Tagalong Moon, which one of us can't relate to what it felt like to really thinking like the moon was following us when we were little, right? So just thinking about the different types of books that we can um, in engage students with to learn about people across racial difference in ways that they might not otherwise. And so especially if they're in communities where they don't really get to see lots of other folks and to learn from people in person, you know, like, like from face, well, face to face or remotely through connecting. And so I tried as much as possible here to have like a variety of images. Um, and, I, and for me, I even when I was making this gallery walk and just in, in being really vulnerable, 
I really veer toward, and then you'll still see in this representation, there are a lot of Black faces because this is what I would like to have seen when I was a kid and what I tried to build for my own for my own children who are now 18 and 19. But also too, I had to intentionally go back because I didn't learn about other groups of people either. So really trying to include books around uh, about indigenous folks and Asian American Pacific Islander folks and, and Latinx folks as well. So just really making sure that there is representation across people groups. And then this other, um, slide here this continues on with the different types of books that we can engage students with around like showing um talking about like native americans as water protectors thinking about native americans not as historical people which is how i know if, if you're anything like me you learned about native americans as yes years ago when we had the first thanksgiving there was this meal that happened between Native Americans and pilgrims and then that's it as if like indigenous folks don't exist anymore and they are that is not true right that there was a, a near genocide but not a complete one and so we really want to be able to make sure that we're teaching students you know an accurate history and also um, about accurate um current as things are currently and so just really being able to enjoy you know enjoy your hair and enjoy your you know your cultural expressions and to be able to learn about that you know, to see that from your own family and community reflected in the classroom is so powerful. And then I'll give an example here too of how we can just take a typical children's book, which is really great when you're supplementing a literacy curriculum because you're not then faced with like, oh, I'm trying to like do this over from scratch or I'm not teaching this curriculum that that I am um, that I am implementing. I don't know how many of you have ever read the shortcut or shortcut by Donald Cruz, but it's one of the one of my favorite examples of how you can teach literacy skills through a book that shows different types of children than students might be used to seeing. So I won't, I'll try not to give too much away because it really is a, a great, a great story. But it's a story of a group of children. I believe that they're cousins in there. He has a series of books around, like, I think it's like Big Mama because they all have the, the, their cousins who have that, they have the same grandmother's house that they would go to. And so what happens is that as children tend to do, they go exploring outside because they were looking for something to do and then they end up on the train tracks, but the train tracks are on an incline and they get to a point where they're at a bend, which you can see on the cover here. And they, they didn't think that the train was coming, but then a train, they start to see the lights in the distance and they hear the sound of the train in the distance. And so basically you have to try to figure out what's going to happen with the, with the children, right? And so we can take a book like this. It's a really a quick read where you can start to make and confirm predictions. You can explore onomatopoeia as a literary device because they really, they, you hear the sounds of the train as part of the story. Um, you can discuss foreshadowing because at one point you see the children's alarmed faces and you see the bright light of the train. And then for pages, you see like clack, 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 clack clack, 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 clack for pages. And you're like, what happened to the kids, right? So you really, you can have the opportunity to have to foreshadow. And then it just features um, examples of children of color just as children doing things that children do. So this is just an example of a way that you can engage, like you can expand the representation in the literature. And also, um, you know, you can also teach the literary skills that you are, that you are, that you are focused on with students. And then like really quickly, I'll just show you'll see the, the, the like smaller version, but you'll see these slides in the um, in the folder. Um, but basically, the, you can also not to the exclusion of history and historical fiction, really be able to teach students things they don't tend to learn or they, they haven't historically tended to learn in social studies and and in history classes where you can learn about like um, what it meant to be. Um, someone who was escaping from enslavement like this story on the top left that Henry's Freedom Box if you've never read it. I highly recommend it. Like Kadir Nelson is one of my favorite illustrators and, and storytellers. And then just even the story, I hadn't heard about this story, even though I grew up in a family with parents who were borderline Black Panthers who taught me quite a bit about Black history. And you see my name, right? I'm Africa Afeni. They wanted to make sure I would always remember my ancestors. And Afeni Shakur was of the Black Panther Party. It's Tupac Shakur's mom. And so they knew a lot and they taught me a lot, but they didn't, they didn't, they did the best they could with what they were able to teach themselves. But this story about Henry's freedom box, like he he mailed himself out of enslavement because he was that determined to be free. So stories like that can be really powerful because a lot, a lot of times the narrative is that people who were enslaved were happy and they were just workers and it wasn't really that bad, right? Or that it happened a long time ago, but there was there was agency in those who were enslaved that we often don't explore. Or even just really leaning into like what happened during Japanese internments or the life of Langston Hughes as a poet, the great migration 
hidden figures, which is like, I didn't know about those women, even though in, until the movie came out, right? And even trying to give a fuller perspective about people out, like Malcolm X, because we often hear a very myopic and, some, and often inaccurate view of his arc as a, a civil rights leader. And so again, this was for me, this slide was more so about my own journey to expand even what I was looking at beyond um, the history of Black folks in the United States and then we're learning more about indigenous history as well from the voices of those who are part of those communities, right? And so just really quickly for secondary students who can continue that on by really being able to engage them in whether it be excerpts as part of a, you know expanded literature, literary curriculum or as opportunities for them to read in, 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 in different ways, there are, um, we can go beyond the typical canon for students to be able to have access to some of these types of stories as well. So more so for middle and high school students as well. So just keeping us moving. Um, I wanna have us get ready to go into, um, into a breakout space to be able to talk about how we can connect with our own literary experiences and, and see how those can help to expand even what we do with our own students. But I wanna model that for you first and tell you a bit about my own, what I learned from Alfred Tatum is a textual lineage. He talks a bit about the importance of being able to make connections to our own literary experiences and the, the and, and literature that was transformative for us. And then how we can use that to build on doing the same thing for students. So when, like I mentioned, my parents were, you know, they were, they had taught themselves quite a bit of their own history. Not, they didn't have that in school, but they learned the best they could. I was so impressed because as I grew up, I know one of my favorite things that I had was an autograph from Alex Haley because my dad was doing community work and got to know him and had a picture with him. And so I was like, the man who wrote Roots, like I have this, this autograph from him as like, I think from the time I was like five or so like that. But when you look at the book, the Before the Mayflower, that's the version of the book that was on my shelves as I was growing up um, where my, my dad actually, we grew up in, an, I grew up in an apartment in Brooklyn where my dad built, we didn't have like a library but he built shelves in the wall. And I remember seeing this book up on the shelf and um, just kind of seeing it because you know, I was a little kid and I wasn't really reading that book, but I remember seeing that book before the Mayflower. And then fast forward a bit. So when I was in 10th grade, I had the opportunity, it was in a, a private school um, that my parents ended up sending me to when things didn't work out very well for me in the lottery to be able to go to a high school of my choice in New York City. Um, but I had an African-American history teacher who used Before the Mayflower as our text for the entire year, which was amazing for me. And one of the things I wanna say is that this teacher, he was a white male teacher who taught me this content. So, and, it, and that was powerful for me, not only to learn that, but to have him engaging us in that learning was so, I think it was really, it meant a lot to me to see that as an example of what was possible in learning. And so basically like we, we went that whole year reading that book together and I loved it because so often whenever I would even hear about people, the people that I had descended from and my family had descended from, it was so often like you descended from slavery or you descended from enslavement. And I'm just like, actually, no, right? That's something that was done to my ancestors, but that's not where the history actually began. So the concept of before the Mayflower and talking about like what was happening in Africa prior to colonization and prior to the triangle trade and prior to the middle passage was really powerful for me because I hadn't seen that before. So we read that book together the whole year. And then we also, list, we watched the um, Eyes on the Prize documentary series as well. And then what you see here um, on the, the before the Mayflower version is like the updated version. I think that's the most recent version where um, it's the same book, but I think it has been updated since it was first written. Um, at this point, even more than the book that I read, the version that I read when I was in, in 10th grade. And so when I think about textual lineages, the way that Alfred Tatum describes it is that it's really like the book that, you know, when you think back to this book, it really started to what shift or change things for you, or maybe you saw something in yourself that was represented for the first time in ways you hadn't seen before. And so um, one of the things I'd like to have you think about, and I'm not gonna have you engage with all of these questions, but I'm just gonna put these, these some of these prompts out there and then we're gonna go and kind of talk about it a bit in the breakout space. What you wanna be thinking about right now before we shift into the spaces is like, think about like, and it can be at any point in your, in your learning journey, but think about the name of a book that was transformative for you. And as you think about that book, think about like when and where you first read the text. 
And if you didn't actually read the text yourself, maybe it was a book that was read to you as a child. It doesn't have to be something that you read yourself, but if someone read it to you, that's something that you could talk about as well. When you think about that book in particular, think about what you still carry with you from that text to this day. And then you can think about how the text influenced you and your identity. And then you could think about maybe what that text might have read you to lead as a result of having had that literary experience. And part of the reason why I want you to be thinking about this is that when you think about your own textual lineage, it can help to inform the type of literary experiences that you design for your students and helping them to really start to develop their own textual lineage. Now, it's very possible that maybe your student's textual lineage might not begin while you are their teacher, but you as in teaching them how to read and how to decode and how to access text is gonna lay the foundation for them maybe being able to develop a textual lineage later. But even having that mindset in the way that you teach is I really feel like it's gonna be a powerful frame for you. And so as we go into the breakout spaces, Phil, we're gonna have we're gonna have about 10 minutes in the breakout space. And I would like for you to think about like, what is that textual lineage for you? What is a book that comes to mind for you? And what does that mean for you when you think about the type of literary experiences that you design for your students? How could it inform the way you think about teaching, reading as you move forward? And so I'm gonna go ahead and um, um, John, if we're if we're ready to be, I'll take the um, let me stop sharing so that we can go ahead and, and see each other's faces a bit more before we go in. But yeah, so you'll be in your space for about 10 minutes and then we'll come back and, and unpack that a bit before we get into the rest of the content. All right, looks like folks are back. And so let me, I'll give my, my uh, introduction to the debrief of the breakout space. Well, I'll tell you what I hate when I'm in a space and, and no one has asked for a reporter going in. And then we come back into the space. It's just like, would someone like to report from their room? And I'm like, nope, not it, not it. <laughs> I'm usually that person. <laughs> So I know I did not ask for anyone to be a reporter and that and, and we didn't need to have a reporter. But what I would love to hear is for folks to be able to say or put in the chat or to be able to say um, not necessarily what some specific person said to you, but just generally speaking, what are some of the things that came out in your discussion um, without sharing someone's story if it, if it feels like it will be a violation of something that someone shared? Just, just like high level what, what came out for you in your discussions. Did you say we could speak up or you want us to yeah, put it yeah, up? Yeah, you can speak up. Yep, you can speak up. Well, one of our conversations, because there was one book in particular that several of us liked to read when we were younger. We were yeah. all women in the group. Okay. Yeah, and how, if we were to go back and read it today, like, it, we would might would need to be careful of some of the stuff in it, just because... Yes. Our times have changed, things have changed. Um, um, but it was, but it was, you know, it was good to hear the different stories. And um, and then we had several generations in our little group too. Oh so. yeah, right, different yeah. generations. I Can I tell you how much Rhonda, I thank you for, for sharing that and that I can relate because I'm like, you know, I grew up in the, you know, like in the eighties and nineties and I'm very big still to this day, love hip hop, right? But sometimes I'll go back and I'm like, ooh, my favorite hip hop song was, and then I listen to the lyrics and I'm like, oh, ooh, oh right. no. Oh no, right? <laughs> like that's, that, is, that is not feminist at all. <laughs> like that's no, no. So and then another right. thing, Miss Mills, like, um, I mean, this might be overshare, I don't know, but it, not answer to your question, but, you know, I have a two-year-old granddaughter, so I'm like three, and I was telling my group, I said, after that beautiful gallery walk you did of the books, like, I was sitting here writing different ones down from different groups, you know, yeah. and I was like, I want to run out there and go to her bedroom and pull the books I bought her and see, like, if it's more, um, baby dolls and things or do I have anything I heard like culturally representative of where we are and now I want to run back there and, and look and go yeah. by books if they're not you know so I'm glad you did that because yeah. it was just a wonderful visual I yeah. think for yeah. us 
um, that we don't think about because yeah, when you see the library, too. you see the rim of the book, you don't see the face. And that was just beautiful. So thank you for that. Oh, you're very welcome. And I'm so, thank you for saying that. And I'm like, I feel like, like all of us go through that, right? Like we, we, we usually choose and pick what is like how we most identify. And it's not by any, like, I do think that there, well, clearly there are people in the world who are like committed to being xenophobic and not really being like, not really appreciating difference and things like that. I'm not talking, I don't believe that that's the majority of us. I believe the majority of us where we don't see the diversity is not because we're being malicious it's because this is what we grew up with and this is what we see in the mirror and this is what we see in our families right so I think it's so important too that you name that and it's like when we like you know that Maya Angelou quote was like you know you do the best you can until you know better and then when you know better you do better right so it's like okay so now it's not to say like every white child can't have any books with white kids so it's not that but it's just like well how about all kids have books that show all kids right exactly exactly thank you Rhonda Anyone else want to share, whether it be what you talked about in your breakout space or even like what Rhonda shared? Um, I'll share. So in my yeah. group, I, um, we were had just a little conversation about the books that you shared with us and that mm -hmm. I often hear in the area that I work that it's so hard to find, you know, books representing diversity and diverse authors and, you know, and I'm like, actually, right. And so, so there's that. <laughs> And then I'm just rem I was reminded of a time I was visiting a school, and the the cultural diversity section of the library was in a milk crate sitting on the floor. Oh, right. Yeah. And that, you know, and so yeah. just it just kind of how are we representing the value and importance of the messages and stories we're bringing to our littles or in our students, right? The littles, but yeah. I think so thank you for reminding me the value of that. You are so welcome. The other piece I was going to say too, that I didn't, I didn't show these books or profile them in particular, but I think like my husband teases me all the time because he's like, anytime you see people working together in solidarity across racial difference, you get so happy. I'm like, yes, I really, I, I love that. Right. And so one of the books that I think about too, is like, um, there's um, Jacqueline Woods, Woodson's book, The Other Side. Oh, if you've seen that book, right? It's like, you know, you see the little black girl and little white girl who just want to play together, but there's segregation in their community and they figure out a way to play that doesn't violate what the adults have asked them for, right? Um, there's another book too that has a similar type of theme. It's called Matthew and Tilly, where they're like, they have, they're in the apartments, right? Like right across from one another and they're friends and they're, they're, they're not the same racially, but they're friends, right? So just say, showing students what's possible, I think is so powerful. Yeah. Yeah, maybe one more comment before we shift into the rest of the content. I appreciate just that you pointed out the need to just have diverse books that show kids as kids and living life and normal experiences. Yeah. Because I think we often focus on like, we need to show them that difference is beautiful and wonderful and even some of our staff aren't feeling ready to have those conversations yet. So I might be turned off by that, but who can argue with, you know, a story about a kid having a pet goldfish who just right. happens to be a black boy. That's yeah. exactly right. It's so true. Right. Cause I'm like, and that, cause that's the thing too, is like, this journey is a, it's a long journey and it's, and it's, and it can be really difficult. And there's, and there's certain access points. It's just like, okay, well, I'm not quite ready for X. But I might definitely be ready for this because like, why not, right? <laughs> why not talk about the little boy like feeling like the moon is chasing him or, you know, like all these different things that are just really all kids trying to figure out how to get away from a train after they got themselves into a tight spot, right? <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So well, what a way, yeah. Oh, yeah, what a good conversation starter though and having those difficult conversations than having a gallery wall of a book or flowers or but the books to me because it was just real because it was people yes um to make it a safe space to use that as an example first before yeah. diving into something that may be uncomfortable for some folks because mm -hmm. to me that was just like oh, simple yeah. but it just felt good and yeah you know yeah awesome Thank you so much. And so I'm like, I can't see the chat actively. So I didn't know if like John or Sarah, if you, if there are some things that came out in particular, just maybe a couple that you want to highlight and then we can save some questions for the end. But anything you want to name before we jump back into the rest of the content? Um, not as much a question, but a comment that I think is just important to put in the air is that yep. the, the idea that this, it's important to have these books, but not to have a mindset of look at all of these books, look at all these diverse books we have, that box has now been checked and we can Absolutely. move on. It's about right. having those books in the space accessible as just part of your collection, not as a separate 
special collection. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And then I'll share something that was, yeah. that I, oh, I'm sorry, did I cut someone off? No, it's okay. I was just going to say, I was going to say something about that. That was Elena's comment down in the chat. And you mentioned Jacqueline Woodson earlier. And so a nice example of doing something that doesn't check off a box, but is inclusive is The Day You Begin by Jacqueline Woodson. <gasps> oh, I right? love that book. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Never once does it talk about race or cultural, anything like that. But what it does is it shows it and it's every day like you mentioned earlier, it's just, it's every day. This is something we all deal with. And so the day you begin is about when you first start school yeah. and it talks about the, and the profiles in this are amazing. So we start with this little girl here, right? Yeah. And it's all about the first day of school. They're um, not necessarily teaching, you know, like anything specific, but you can hear it in here. Maybe it'll be your skin, your clothes or the curl of your hair. Mm -hmm. And then it just keeps going through. You've got a nice mix and it's talking about how when you first start your first day of school, how we all have these internal feelings and these fears that we have going through us, and they end up bringing in a little boy from Venezuela, and they have the they have different adventures that the kids went on. And and I guess what I'm saying is, you're not teaching to the box with this book. You're teaching no. how do we all feel on the first day of school, guys? It's so relatable, right? So and, because everyone has that experience, and we have a whole bunch of books about the first day of school that we read during the first week, anyways. So. Yeah. Why not there, right? add it? Yeah. <laughs> how do you say? How do you know? You also say sorry. How do you say your first name? Oh, Rhiannon. Rhiannon. Thank you yes. so much, Rhiannon. I mean, the other thing I'll say too, and then I'll, I'll put the slide deck back up to take us through our last part. But um, I was just talking to a teacher friend who I I'm like this. Like, if I find someone, I'm like, I know you don't know me. I know I just found you on Instagram. I'd like to be your friend though because I like what you're posting. And so I connected with someone, a kindergarten teacher, and had a great conversation with her. She was talking about how she had gotten a bunch of books about deaf students because she had a student who was deaf one year. And then she didn't have that student anymore the next year. And her initial response was going to be like, oh, I, I'm going to put these books away. And then she was like, wait, hold on. Just because that student and or no deaf students are in the class right now, there's no reason why we shouldn't still read about deaf students, right? And so that's the other thing I would encourage you is that you don't need to have, like, there doesn't need to be that student present in the room in order to, like, validate this is why we're doing it. It's just that you do it because it's just it's just what we do, right? It's just we explore across all the differences, right? And so, and, and because it's so like all of what what makes us all so beautiful as people, we all want to be able to explore that. So wonderful, wonderful conversation. So let me go ahead. I'm going to put the slide deck back up to take us through our last part of the conversation. Yeah, trying to make sure I'm showing the right window because <laughs> sometimes I do not show the right one. All right, so you should be seeing too many mirrors, not enough windows, perfect, okay. So you've seen the image already. And so what I wanna talk about too is that part of the reason why I think about from this perspective is because I spent a lot of my career thinking about culturally responsive teaching and learning or culturally responsive and sustaining. And that is critical, critical to our practice as educators. And at the same time, what I've also noticed is that in that conversation, we don't often talk about what does it mean to for white students as we're teaching them how to be anti-bias and anti-racist as well. We need to be able to do both of those things at the same, so it's not either or, it's the both and. And so one of the things I wanted to be able to share with you is that when we're thinking about how making sure that, like you know, thinking back to those infographics we looked at at the beginning, that we wanna make sure that if we have a situation where white students or students who are, who are not marginalized, who may be experiencing a lot of advantage in different parts of their identity, if we wanna make sure that they are not just seeing <laughs> all mirrors, we wanna make sure they're seeing windows, we have to make sure that we're thinking about you know, what does it mean to like expand, the, you know, the, the, the images and the stories that they're learning about people who are different from them, especially racially and ethnically? Because I think about it for a lot, a lot of what I think is at the heart of like unconscious bias or implicit bias branching off into microaggressions and, and micro inequities and, and all the different ways that that can show up in, in an interrupted sense of belonging for, um, for Black and Brown students or marginalized students is that with when you know the, the white students are largely if especially if there are not so many people who are different from them living in their community a lot of what they're learning is from tv or movies or the media which may and often is not a really appropriate or 
accurate representation of different groups of people. And so we want to make sure that we as practitioners are offering students a chance to get to really know people off, like authentically for who they are not thinking about it from a, um, a stereotypical perspective. So we want to make sure that we're showing like, you know, so the, the, this, this, I pulled the screenshot from Twitter of like the image of this Black woman as a scientist. How often, aside from hidden figures, do we hear about Black women being discussed as scientists? We, we don't often. I know I, I don't, right? And I don't think I'm I don't think I'm alone in that. And so we want to make sure that we're looking at the contributions of people across difference, especially from marginalized groups of people. And then we're really thinking about, like I talked about in the, the slide deck earlier in the gallery walk, that we're not showing like these single stories for anyone who's seen um, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's TED talk around the danger of a single story, right? We don't want to be telling these single stories about any groups of people. No group of people is monolithic. And we want to make sure that the way that we're teaching our students about any group of people is expansive and as accurate as we as we can. And so we want to think about multi, multiple genre and not really only focusing on struggle, but just also focusing on joy and create, you know, creativity and inventions and all of the things that we really want students to learn. And then this piece too, I just really pulled um, in some examples from um, like seeing where um, different representation across difference when it comes to our political figures and thinking about like say Malala Yous Yousafzai who's an amazing example of like persisting to get her education even though in a situation where it was really complicated. Some different examples of like that you've seen a, a little bit on some of the other slides as well. But the one I really wanna focus on which is one of my favorite stories and I won't read the whole letter but um, this is one of my favorite, oh, let me go back one slide because I want to show you who I'm talking about. So I don't know if you've heard the story of Lewis Hayden. This is a picture of him here on the upper right hand of the slide. And so I learned about him. I had the pleasure of being part of, a, um, there was an institute that took place that was in, a, a project in collaboration between Boston Public Schools, Suffolk University, and what was then the Museal, Museum of Afro, then became Museum of African American History. And it was about um, um, the abolitionist movement. And I'm like, oh, I didn't really know a lot about abolitionists at that point. And so Lewis Hayden was an abolitionist who actually really was very instrumental in the Underground Railroad um, on, as part of the Freedom Trail and in and, and that part of Boston. Um, many people came through his home on, on Beacon Hill. I love his story because he escaped from enslavement, learned how to read and write, and then wrote a letter back to the person who was his owner to let him know what he thought, <laughs> what he thought, right? And so, like I said, I won't read the whole letter, but he, he opens it with like, Mr. Baxter, sir, you have already discovered me absent. This will give you notice where and why. I was never a great friend to the institution of robbing and crushing slavery, and have finally become sick of the whole concern and have concluded for the present to try my freedom and how it will seem to be my own master and manage my own matters and crack my own whip, right? So I'm just like, how probably, like, we don't often hear about this, people escaping from enslavement and writing letters back to the people who had enslaved them, right? And then the part that really, like, every time I read it, it just really, like, it, it breaks my heart. It also just, I, I can't even imagine what this felt like for him. He talks about, like, you know, like, how, how it was hard for him to go through this learning process, but now that he's saying, like, in this, toward the end of the letter, he said, you know, that he, um, he means to go back to school more, and that his, his little son is going to school, and I intend shall be able to write his own pen at the instance and impulse of his swelling soul. And I'm like, oh, Oh my gosh, right? So these are the kind of things that like, we don't have to like go apart from the curriculum so much. Like this is a letter that we can actually show and say like, here's, here's what this man was able to do. And what do you think it meant for, for him to be able to be free and to be able to have his son be able to be free and to learn how to read, right? And to learn how to read and write and to be able to determine your own, you know, your own fate. We also want to think about windows into other experiences. And so, like I mentioned before, this is like when I was saying like the window and mirror could be two sides of the same coin, is that when I was talking before about even expanding my own understanding of indigenous folks, I've had a friend who's been amazing, amazing support for me in this area. Her, her people are um, from the Arawak tribe. And um, it just has really transformed the way I thought about so many things. And, and just even learning about like when the Dakota Access Pipeline, when that story took place, I was like, I didn't really fully understand what was happening. But as I started to learn more about like, what does it mean to be a water protector and why are people protesting and, and what is happening in that, in that space is even being able to look at things that are happening currently and to be able to show windows into other experiences. 
And so like to really read and from the different perspectives of what's happening there. Um, I know it's for, it's for like older students, but Zen Education Project has some really great resources because a lot of times they'll take a particular issue and look at it from multiple perspectives. So it's not just about the water protectors, but it's like, what, what, what is the perspective of the tribal men, members and the energy transfer partners and the farmers in the in the you know, organization in the area and the trade unions like what is everyone's perspective about that so we really can show them diverse perspectives on different things and then also too like really helping students like I mentioned a bit earlier is to come away from this single story and often like a deficit story about groups of people I will say like this is like just being really vulnerable with you all is that even being a black woman there are times where like when I see even the images like the images here it's it's not something that I'm accustomed to seeing. I feel like I'm more accustomed to seeing Black men um, depicted as being in prison or being arrested or being athletes, and pr primarily that's it, right? So when I think about the image of a Black man just lovingly holding his child, we don't see that very often, right? And so just really even taking the opportunity to just grab images and show those things, whether it be in picture books or images that we show students, to show other perspectives and so that they're not just getting a deficit narrative about people who are different from them is really important. And we can do that through a lot of different ways. We can do it in literature circles and discussions and as we use literature and we use images for some of those things as well. And so wanted to even like, oh, just really wanted to feature the work. I have these beautiful, beautiful colleagues. You may have seen their work before. Jenna Chandler Ward and Elizabeth Denevi are the two women who host the, um, and, and, and who are responsible for the Teaching While White um, podcast and blog. And um, they, I got to, I got to co-author a piece with them a little while ago, like uh, within the past year, where we really explored the fact that a lot of times, when it comes to white students learning about diversity, it can be very confusing, right? Because when we talk about diversity, we're like, everybody should be proud of who they are and proud of where they come from. And then when it's like, when we think about white kids, it's just like us too, like, can we say we're proud to be white? And like, oh, well, if a white kid says that, that could get complicated. <laughs> so it's like really thinking about like exploring whiteness with students and being like, yes, like when we think about some things that have happened historically in this country and in different parts of the world, those are some hard things, right? And we, and we teach them about it in a way that is developmentally appropriate. We're not gonna have the same conversations with a kindergartner that we might have with students as they get into upper elementary and moving on to middle and high school. But just really being able to say like, it's, it's really true that just like I was saying, like, you know, the stories that I love to see is folks working together in solidarity is that we have, they have been white folks who have been working against oppression for years, who were working as abolitionists and who were working together to make sure that society was fair for everyone. And we, in, in addition to white students often not being able to see through, you know, through windows into other folks, the oftentimes the mirrors that they see mirroring themselves back to themselves is a bit distorted and doesn't even quite show like what have white people done that have like good things, like not just historical things that are, that are hard to talk about, but what are things that folks have done that have been really powerful, important things as far as moving toward liberation. And so this resource is really great because it lists a lot like lists of white folks who are doing this work, people who are freedom riders. And like I said, abolitionists. And I don't know if you know the story of like James Tyson who worked together with Bree Newsom around like the removal of the Confederate flag in, in um, South Carolina, where he hugged the pole that she was climbing up so that if the police tagged the, tased the pole, which they were planning to do, he would be, his body would absorb that shock and it wouldn't affect her and she wouldn't fall off the pole she was doing that. So I think we need to also make sure we're, we're showing white students um, proper mirrors and not distorted mirrors. And we need to see those things ourselves because we probably haven't seen them ourselves when we were younger either, or even in our adulthood. And so we basically just generally, we want to make sure that we have more windows and more mirrors for students. And so definitely wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity for, um, I'll, I'll take the slide down just for now because I'd love to be able to see more faces, but would love to have an opportunity to engage in a bit of, I have Q and A up here, but I love the frame of questions and discussion more than questions and answers. I do not consider myself an expert by any means, but I do consider myself a committed learner and sharer. And so I'd love to engage with, with any questions that we might have. So you can either unmute or if there are questions that have come up in the chat, I can take a look at the chat now too to see. I have a question maybe you yeah. can speak to like, you know, obviously, you know, we want to incorporate, you know, more diverse books, more relevant books. How do we, how do we do a better job of uh, including our community uh, and our families in 
in making that happen. So it's not just the school deciding, oh, we're going to adopt these books or these books, but how do we bring, you know, different stakeholders into that to determine which books and who has a voice and say and how we incorporate those. Yeah, uh, thank you for that question, John. I can think I, I can think about this from a perspective because like I carry an interesting perspective with me as both an educator and a mom of, of black children. And I'm like, I really wish that my students, that my children's teachers had asked that question that you just talked about, because there were so many books that I intentionally bought and made sure were part of my children's library that I would love to have been part of their, their classroom experience, but it wasn't really, that wasn't really the case. And so I think sometimes it's just as simple as asking the question, especially like, and, and I'll, here's, here's the caveat that I'll give. I believe that going back to school in the fall is going to be something like we've never encountered that before, right? We do not know yet what it's going to be like to return to school and whatever that's going to look like um, post or even in the midst of on the tail end of depending where we're at in the fall, right, of a pandemic. So I know that that's a major concern as it should be. And so we already have quite a ton on our plates already. And at the same time, I do think that, you know, in the, this is like a lot of what I think we did post, I mean, pre-pandemic that will hopefully, hopefully was able to continue a bit during the pandemic and we can get back to it. When we, when we're first meeting our new students for in the fall, a lot of times we'll send home that getting to know you questionnaire. And we want to ask about the students, what are their favorite things? What are their favorite books and movies and hobbies and all these types of things? I think one way to do that, and I'll, this is another vulnerable space for me. I remember being a classroom teacher sending home those surveys, looking at them quickly, but then never incorporating anything that anyone told me <laughs> into anything I was doing. Because I was really, it was like, because I was checking off a box, just to be really honest. It's like, it's good to give students the opportunity to be known, even if we don't fully finish the cycle, I just want them to at least have been asked, right? And so I think that I think that happens with a lot of us, because there's a lot that we're doing as teachers. But I think if we can take the opportunity to specifically say, okay, this is my goal is to diversify the literature and I'm going to pay particular attention to what the families say back when I'm asking them not only the child like what are you not only asking what are the children's favorite books, but asking the family maybe I mean maybe not quite textual lineages unless you feel like that's going to be something that resonates for families what to say like what were your favorite books or what are your favorite things to read and trying to find ways to incorporate that in or even have families to be able to come in, like read, you know, read some of their favorite things to students as appropriate. So I think just asking the question and then being intentional to incorporate it, um, I think is pretty key. Yeah. Yeah, that, that resonates a lot. We had uh, Dr. Floyd Cobb uh, on our first day talk oh. about belonging, and that's a big piece that he talked about. It's like, it's great. Like, you got to ask kids and you got to ask families about belonging and all that. But the yeah. worst thing you can do is ask the question and ask what we can do about it and then don't do anything with that because that exactly. makes it worse. Like you're better off not asking the question if you're not going to do anything exactly. with it. So I agree. And I think we all know that, right? Like I think how yeah. many times have we received like a staff survey or something like that? And then you like, you might take the time, to, like pour your heart out and be like, I'm so glad you asked because I'm very concerned about this and you write it all out and then you never hear about it again. Like we know what that feels like. And so we don't want to perpetuate that. We want to make sure we actually do. And then let maybe even like to, to hold ourselves accountable to not only ask the question but to let the families know here's what I'm planning to do with that information right and then maybe it's not going to be something I'm going to implement immediately in September or even October but to say this is going to inform what I'm planning to do in this classroom throughout the school year so thank you for sharing and then to, and then really just try to stick with it and keep the communication going about it yeah Oh, like seeing in the chat. Okay, I'm looking at the chat too. Making me want to go back to teaching in the classroom. <laughs> You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Any other questions, comments, any tips needed? I'm happy to, to be a resource and to share my experience and learnings. I know one of the things that I face, even as a parent, and this has been so hard, I, I would expect like, yes, I'm, you know, not only am I an educator and I love books, like I consume books. It's just a bit absurd how much I'm like the audio books and then I buy the physical copy of the book and then I read along with it as I'm listening to the audio book if I can. And then so I'm like, I expected my children to all, you know, to each of them love books as much as I did. My son is just like, yeah, I, I read because I'm asked to. I don't really have books that I read because I choose. I'm just like, are you kidding me? That can't be true. He's just like, yeah, it really is true. Right? <laughs> It's true. So sometimes to also be prepared for that is sometimes 
like some like sometimes folks might not be like books might not be it maybe it's more poetry maybe it's more a certain type of certain genre right so maybe it's not books maybe it's a poem right so just making sure we're also expansive in the way we're thinking about like what literary experiences or things resonate with people that doesn't necessarily have to be a picture book or a chapter book it can be different types of literature or different types of experiences yeah All right, so I am learning to like lean into the silence, which is important, but also to know when we are we are wrapping up and that's also important. So I just wanted to take the time to say thank you. Like I am so genuinely grateful to all of you for taking the time to share space and to reflect and to share with me and with one another. And I just wanna say like, just thank you for your presence and that I wish like I'm so cheering for and rooting for everyone as we navigate through this, this, this I don't know if I wanna say brave new world. I don't know if that's quite it. It's just, but it's, it's hard. Like what we have before us is really hard, but just really glad that we have one another and glad that we got to spend this time together. So thank you. Thank you so much. And I hope you have a really great rest of the day.